What do you offer the world? What do you want to leave behind? These things are something that the, the questions that should be the questions that motivate political action. But instead, political, the root word is politics. And politics is decided by shady deals between elites. And nobody really ever thinks, how do we want to leave this world and then honestly pursue that? Today's guest is not that politician. And that's what makes him an incredible politician, in my opinion. He has years of experience inside the tech bubble, which we talk about in this podcast. A little frightening, quite honestly. It earned him a position of the uh, president, uh, presidential ambassadors for global entrepreneurship in the Obama White House. Then he decided, hey, I know what I want to do. I want to run as a Democrat in 2020. His presidential bid is what made him a household name, but uh, also dragged him through the mud. Watching the Democratic nominee debates, it was obvious that he was probably at least a decade ahead of any other presidential candidate, and nobody wanted to deal with what he was talking about. I have for a very long time. He is talking about and writing about issues that truly matter, because they are issues that we're all going to face. And um, people don't even know what they are, let alone, oh, that's never going to happen. He's offering solutions for now uh, in the age of automation. He's also taking on um, capitalism and a way forward for the election. He wants to usher in capitalism, but a new kind of capitalism. He calls it human capitalism. He also thinks everybody should get $1,000 every month. These things I disagree with, but we have a fascinating conversation on. If I had to boil down his message, it would be, current system isn't working, uh, and things are about to get much, much worse, so we need to innovate quickly. The system is broken. The path to improvement is left or right. He says, no, it's not. It's forward. That's the name of his, uh, uh, of his new book, a political party as well, founded by our guest. He outlines all of it in his book and in this podcast. Forward notes on the future of our democracy. Please welcome Andrew Yang. I want to talk to you about something uncomfortable, and it is abortion. Uh, it is the leading cause of death in the U.S., that crazy? Since Roe versus Wade, over 62 million babies have been aborted in the U.S. Nearly one in four pregnancies end in abortion. I met some people here recently. They're part of the Ministry of Preborn, and they have partnered up with Blaze Media to help rescue 10,000 babies in 2021. That's the end of this month, or next month. <laughs> Can sometimes I forget what month we're in. It's going so fast. Preborn is the direct competition to Planned Parenthood. They're the largest provider of ultrasounds in the U.S. And what they have found is by letting women who are thinking about having an abortion see an ultrasound of their baby and hear the heartbeat, it brings the chances that she's going to choose life for her baby up a staggering 80%. Preborn. They partner with the clinics in the highest abortion rate cities and regions. Their passion is saving babies and helping people come to Christ. Over the past 15 years, they have counseled over 340,000 women giving the ultrasound. That has saved 169,000 babies. And over 51,000 women have surrendered their lives to Christ. Will you help? Rescue 10,000 babies. It's really easy. Just a small donation makes a huge difference. To donate, dial pound 250 and say the uh, keyword baby. That's pound 250, keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash Glenn. Now through a match, your gift is doubled, saving twice as many babies. Do it now.
Andrew, how are you, sir? Hey, Glenn. How are you? Very good. Me. It's uh, it's good to have you. I I've been fascinated by you for a very long time, and uh, you'd never come on. <laughs> we've we've asked for two years. You'd never come on, and I think that was probably very smart. If you were running as a Democrat, you wouldn't want me fawning on you. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, you're in now, and I. I think there's more in common than we have differences on. We might disagree on some policies, but I really would like to pick your brain and go deep on some uh, on some topics that are very concerning to me. And they are to you uh, as well. And they're not the topics that politicians are talking about. I would, I would enjoy that. And okay. I, I suspect you're right. OK, so first, let me just. Uh, lay the groundwork on one thing i can have a conversation and and this is something we didn't have to use to say we never had to uh have some sort of a litmus test to talk to each other but um if you're trying to throw out the constitution or the bill of rights i don't know where we connect you know what i mean so let me just ask you do you agree with the bill of rights as written Yes. Okay. So there's no tinkering with the Bill of Rights. You believe in freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and, you know, trial juries and search warrants and guns, all of that. Uh, I believe in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. <laughs> okay. Well, I, it, okay, good. Um, because I don't think anybody is. I think a lot of our problems stem from we don't care about the Bill of Rights anymore. And our rights are being horribly, horribly violated, or we're setting ourselves up for some sort of China uh, system, it seems to me. Let's start with just uh, go ahead. Do you have a comment on that? I don't know. I mean, uh, there are uh, some very, very tough times ahead, um, which is what drove me to run for president uh, in 2018. Um, and it, it drives me still. I mean, anyone listening to this or watching you is probably on the same page where we don't think things are exactly heading towards um, a scenario we'd like to pass to our kids, truly. Um, and it's so irritating for me. I mean, um, we sent somebody out to um, report on your campaign uh, at The Blaze, and the guy we sent out, he said, I watched a lot of the politicians. He said, and Andrew Yang is the most honest um, of all of the politicians. He said, um, you would go out, you would actually listen to what the other politicians would say. You'd actually listen uh, and not have a rote answer for people that were uh, talking to you on the sidelines. You're not a politician. Do you consider yourself one? If I am a politician, Glenn, I'm a very accidental one and po possibly a poor one. <laughs> my, 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 my wife comments on the fact that I'm a terrible liar. Um, but for, for me, I consider myself an entrepreneur and a problem solver. And the problems just have gotten so serious that I at some point said, look, I want to contribute. I want to help. I'm not that interested in holding elected office. I will confess that, too. That it's not like it, that if I could just finagle my way to some, you know, like like a appointed role or elected office, then you know, like I, I don't care about most of those things. <laughs> you know, but I think yeah. that's what Americans yeah. are looking for. Partly, that was part of the charm of Donald Trump. He didn't care about all of that. He didn't. He didn't grow up wanting to be president. And he didn't care what anybody thought of him. Um, and that's really refreshing in many ways. Uh, so I think it's a, a point in your favor that you're you're a bad politician and a bad liar. Um, I, I, I'm at a point where and I think most people are. The problems are getting so huge and I want to stop hearing from all of these. I'm not an ageist um, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm, I'm older than you are. And I. I'm tired of these 80 year olds who have absolutely no idea what tech even is, who are running this country like it's 1950. The world is completely changing. And I would honestly 
rather talk to you or Elon Musk about solving our problems than any politician in Washington because they don't they have no vision over the horizon. None. Well, they're not rewarded for having that vision, Glenn. Uh, One of the big themes of my book is that people are following their incentives. And unfortunately, we're at a time in American life where if everyone does the reasonable thing according to their incentives, we are sunk. Um, Now, you'd imagine that our government leaders would have some rewards for trying to plan for the future and AI and compete against China and a bunch of other things. But it turns out their job security and their rewards have nothing to do with whether they actually are planning for the future in that way. Uh, They don't understand most of the issues because, as you say, many of them are in their 70s or even 80s. Uh, And they might not have even answered their own email, um, much less reckoned with what's happening in the world right in the world of technology. It's not that I mean, you know, my my parents are old. My wife's parents are older. They use email. They they are somewhat up to date. You know, it's not like a 20 year old kid. But these people have been isolated and have been there forever. They they have no interest even in any of it. Yeah, a lot of them have been in office for 20 to 30 plus years. Uh, and I do think that one of the frustrations a lot of Americans feel is that our system's not rejuvenating itself or renewing itself. <laughs> you know, like, like you have folks uh, who uh, have been around for a long time running the country into the ground and then everyone's like, oh, this doesn't seem to be going well. Uh, but the system can't challenge itself. Uh, that the system is going to just keep grinding on. Uh, it's one reason why I think many people did support Donald Trump is because he represented some something different. Change, change really. It's, I think Donald Trump and Barack Obama were elected in many ways for the same reason. They both campaigned basically on change. Um, uh, one. I think that was part of Bernie's appeal too. Bernie yeah. also represented a sort of change. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. So let's talk about what's over the horizon. Uh, I want to talk to you about tech. I want to talk to you about uh, um, cryptocurrency. Um, But what would you say the biggest problem is that we face today? Where would you start? Well, my, my book starts with polarization, which is that right now the extreme points of view on both sides uh, are whipsawing our politics and our media. Uh, and there, there's a whole set of people who don't feel like they have a voice in our politics, by the way, because they don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they feel that way because it's, it's kind of accurate. Uh, and, uh, we're realistically careening towards some version of civil war 2.0, um, more quickly and, and powerfully than we are leading to some kind of national renewal or coming together. Uh, I'd say that dysfunction is making it so that the other problems on the offing, like, for example, China's lapping us in AI uh, or climate change, changing our way of life, like our our government isn't able to uh, have any kind of coherent strategy around technology or other issues because uh, the polarization and dysfunction are so baked in. So what is the... I mean, that's why I started with the Bill of Rights. I mean, that's that's where government, they're handcuffed. And if they just actually did just follow those rules, a lot of our problems would go away. A lot of our problems would go away because they're not they are not um, defending them, following them. They're not promoting them. And a lot of our our discontent is because the government is actually fostering this us against them and the media is following into that as well if you just looked at the freedom of speech and somebody was saying look everyone has a right you're not going to like it you're not going to like it but they have a right to say it they have a right to question these things just that alone there's no leadership on that so how do we get there when as you say, everybody's incentivized to divide. Yes. Well, I want to go back to first principles. When you talk about the Constitution and the founding of the country, you know what was not in the Constitution? The Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Like, like, you know uh, that neither party existed. George, George Washington, Washington warned against it. 
Yes. Uh, John Adams in 1780 wrote that two parties would be uh, an evil <laughs> upon the republic. Um, so what we think of as carved in stone with the duopoly is something that came into existence years and even decades later. The Republican Party didn't even exist until the Civil War era. Yeah, yeah, 1865. Or, um, I'm sorry, 1855. Had, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then, yeah, it, it really came into its own in the 1860s, so you're not entirely wrong. Um, and it, it started out as a northern anti-slavery party, like around the Civil War era. Uh, the two parties were ideologically closer together until the 1960s when the civil rights movement um, started to change things. Uh, but this duopoly we take for granted is very much a fabrication. <laughs> like they came up with it at some point later. Uh, and then when you talk about the politicization of our media at this point, unfortunately, media organizations have made a choice and said, look, we're going to either cater to one side or the other, because that's what the audience has now been trained to expect. Um, so our founders would be shocked and horrified if they were to just sort of wake up and look around and be like, wait, what's going on? Like you have two parties. <laughs> I think around 1820, they would have, they would have come back and said, so when did America end? I mean, but we are way off the track. They wouldn't, they would not believe that this is run by the Constitution that they wrote. There, there's no way they would believe that. Yeah, we, we layered in all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and a lot of the stuff is not serving us well at all. Uh, and I know that a lot of people that may be watching or, or listening to this have a libertarian uh, uh, impulses. Uh, if you're a libertarian in this country, you must feel completely left out and marginalized because, uh, you know, even though that libertarians are clearly uh, the closest thing we have to a third party in the U.S., uh, it's very difficult to so much as get on the ballot in a lot of races. You get completely locked out in the media. Uh, like people are just brainwashed to think that you can only have an R or a D in office in the vast majority of the country. Uh, and this is something I would love to I see think change. I would too, but I... Uh, um... You know, the, the problem, speaking just of libertarians, because I consider myself a libertarian, um, but I'm not pure enough for other libertarians. And I never have understood that. Wait a minute. Libertarianism should be about the freedom to be you, you know, and we're going to disagree on things. But that doesn't not make me a libertarian. That makes me somebody who thinks differently than you. And, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because. I really disagree with UBI, but I see exactly the same problems on the horizon that you do, and I don't have a better answer. So I want to hear, I, I want to be able to talk to you about UBI as somebody who thinks it's a horrible idea, but I also know what's on the other side. Yeah. What else could we do? Can you explain the problem of why we would need a UBI? I have a lot of friends who work in Silicon Valley, uh, tech entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and 95% of them are convinced that artificial intelligence is going to wipe out millions of jobs in industries around the country. And an obvious one that most people will understand and have direct experience with, there are 2 million Americans who work in call centers right now, picking up the phone, customer service, uh, and Google's AI now can do that job better, maybe right now, <laughs> as we're having this conversation. And so if Google's AI ends up sweeping away hundreds of thousands of jobs, what do those families do? The scenario I was warning about on the campaign trail was imagine autonomous uh, cars and trucks where when you call Uber, just an Uber human. shows up and, that, not, and that is going to happen. That will happen. Yeah, that, that will happen. Uh, to the extent that there are impediments in that direction, a lot of them are regulatory, you know, and, and one of the things that you're going to see, Glenn, is that certain industries, let's call them doctors, <laughs> are going to lobby very actively saying, no, 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 like you can't no, have a robot I mean, surgeon. Look, doctors, have doctors were the ones who came out against anesthesia in the 1800s. 
because they were not good. You were based. If you did surgery, the best doctors were the fastest doctors. And so when anesthesia came, now you could finesse. Well, those guys who were really fast were not necessarily the best. And they campaigned against anesthesia. That's the problem is. And that's where government always gets involved and says, well, now, wait a minute, we'll make the no. Let it change. Let the process work its way through. Stop protecting industries that are dying. I, I, I bet you believe by 2030, maybe 2035, people will say, yeah, yeah, doc, but what did the machine say? What did the computer say? What did the AI say? Because it will be better at diagnosis than the average really good doctor. Right or wrong? It, it is correct because the AI is going to be able to reference tens of thousands of cases, you know, like the latest scholarship. I mean, there, there's no doctor <laughs> that, that, that's going to be pouring through every last medical journal every night. You know, I mean, you're always coming up with new things. Um, so what the doctors do is they, they do something very important. Um, they they pattern match. Uh, you know, they, they base it on the hundreds or even thousands of cases that they've seen and say, okay, this reminds me of this, this reminds me of that. Um, but an AI can reference different sets that are more uh, geographically uh, disparate. Uh, they can home in on the latest advances in a way that a human doctor can't. Uh, they have no emotion. You know, there's no bias. They'll just look at it and be like, well, you know, th th this, um, these are just the facts. So even now, a doctor should be consulting with an AI and getting confidence levels or probability levels being like, OK, there's an 85 percent chance that, you know, you should be thinking it's this. Uh, and the institutions right now are protecting doctors because the doctors are very, very powerful. I mean, th this is something that I would like to see change. Uh, it, the other really unconscionable thing, Glenn, we have to know we've had a massive doctor shortage in this country for decades. You know, you go to rural areas and you have to drive two hours to get to a, a doctor, a specialist. You know why that is? Because the AMA has been restricting supply of doctors. You know, you know, you think there's a shortage of humans that want to be doctors? No. <laughs> Do you think there's a shortage of a need for doctors? No. So, but so what it is is the medical lobby said, you know what? Let's like cap the number of doctors. Uh, let's make sure you can't open new medical schools. Like that, there, there's a lot of stuff going on that um, that serves an industry well, but doesn't necessarily so serve the public. So that's why we came here in the first place. I mean, it, originally the pilgrims, because of church, we don't want that church. We want our own church and we want to be left alone. And when we had a new country, it was easy to get rid of all of that stuff, but we didn't keep it. So there's no place for us to go unless you're on Elon Musk's uh, spaceship. How do you reset this system to get rid of all of the cronyism without destroying it, without completely burning it down? That is the question. That is the project, Glenn. And I have a plan. <laughs> I'm the man with a plan. Uh, so, oh, yeah. So right now... There's a higher appetite for a third party or moving on from the duopoly than there has been ever, essentially. Uh, almost two thirds of Americans say they want a choice aside from one of the two major parties. I, uh, independents um, are the most numerous group in terms of self-identification relative to Republicans or Democrats. This is particularly true, by the way, among young people. Young people like are allergic <laughs> to, to the two major parties. The yeah, only they, difference, they, they, I think know, they, the only difference between many young people and um, maybe people of my age, and this is there's fewer on my age, but there's still a lot. The only real difference was we've seen the Libertarian Party and the Green Party and everybody else try it over and over and over and over again, and they never get traction. And so, I mean, with youth comes a little more optimism. What is going to set this movement apart from any of those other movements that w that marveled at six percent of the vote. Yeah. So the the problem is very very fundamental. Check it out. 
is that if you run as a Republican or Democrat, um, then you have a lot of voters who are conditioned to vote for you. You have media organizations that will support you and elevate you. And then you have a donor network that will enable you to run and compete. If you try and run as a libertarian or a forward party um, or anything else, then none of those things exist. <laughs> like the votes, the media, and the money are not in place to support you. Uh, also, by the way, the mechanics work against you because the two parties have made it very, very difficult even to get on the ballot as a, another party in a lot of districts. So in that environment, then it's extraordinarily difficult to try and compete. So how do we do it? What is the plan? The plan is to actually go and change the mechanics at the state levels so that different points of view can emerge and you have a chance to compete in a more genuine way. It turns out because our founding fathers were not into political parties, nothing in the constitution about it, all of the inventions and fabrications around uh, the two parties are at the state level. The, the states have set it up so that you have certain rules and so you can change it at Wait, the state um, without no, an you, act of Congress. Hang on. You agree with that, right? Elections mm -hmm. held at the state level. Federal government should not be doing it. Yeah, I'm going to suggest in this case, this is like our saving grace. Because the fact is, if you had to try and get something through the U.S. Congress, you know. There is a, I, so, the only reason why I ask so, that is because there's a push to federalize all that, which would be a nightmare. You're right. The system is broken and it's broken in the state level. So that's. Every state needs to start. Everybody who wants a free election should be standing up right now in their state and saying, get rid of all of that stuff. Let these things run free and fair. Yes. 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 That's exactly right. This is our hope, Glenn, that enough Americans stand up and go to their state legislators or in half of the states around the country, you don't even need the state uh, the state lawmakers to get on board. You can have a ballot initiative. You just get enough people in Alaska or Missouri um, uh, or uh, Massachusetts or wherever um, and just say, look, we'd like to change it so that anyone can run from any party in the election uh, and may the best person win. And we can vote for whomever we want. There's no spoiler effect. There's no like, oh, you you made the bad people win. <laughs> you just set it off, set it up so it's an open, nonpartisan primary. And then you have instant runoff so that people can vote for whomever they like. And believe it or not, one state already made this change. Alaska made this change last year. Just a bunch of Alaskans got together and said, we're sick of the parties. We're sick of a tiny minority controlling everything. Let's make it so that it's a true democracy. Like, you know, people from any point of view can run. And so we can do the, what they did in Alaska and states around the country. And that is our hope, Glenn. If we get enough people, Americans, standing up and saying, we're sick and tired of this mess, this dysfunction, we can flip this switch. And then if you flip the switch in, let's call it, I don't know, six, eight states around the country, then a state like New York, where I live, is, is going to be shamed, where everyone's going to be like, wait a minute, like, why is it that, that, that other states have it so that you could vote for anyone of any party? And here in New York, it's just like, you know, Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. Um, uh, so this is our path out. And I would love for us to get some uh, real life examples of more states following Alaska's lead in 2022 so that then this wave can take place around the country um, and free us from the madness. So that that's the project of the forward party is to enable true lowercase d democracy in states around the country as quickly as we can. Well, that would be good. Uh, and I would support you. And I, I mean, I campaign with you for that. I mean, I, I think that's really that is the answer to most of our problems. People have been cut out. Uh, the decision is made, yep. um, you know, long before people actually vote. Um, not I mean, they still have the right to vote for the individual. But I, I have a I'm building a museum of American history and it includes all the good things and the bad things. Uh, and one of them is a ballot from Alabama. And uh, the Democrats were trying to say, no, 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 we're not racist. We blacks can vote, except they can't vote in the primary. 
And so we have a ballot of the Alabama white primary. So an African-American could not vote in the primary. But hey, vote for any white person you want after that. I mean, that stuff has to stop. Yeah, there's a famous quote from uh, William Boss Tweed, uh, who ran the New York political machine, where he said, you can do the electing as long as I get to do the nominating, (laughs) which, by the way, is exactly what's happening in races around the country. It's like, oh, you can show up to vote after we've made it so that, frankly, you know, you don't have a meaningful choice. And a lot of Americans sense that that's what the game is. Let me talk to you about body armor. I never thought I've been doing this for 40 some years. I never thought I would have to talk about body armor for sale ever. I never thought I'd have to wear it until I got into the mainstream media. And uh, that was scary. What's even scarier is when you actually think you need it for your children and your family as well. I've been in that situation for about 20 years um, 20 years ago, body armor was really expensive and the average person, you know, they couldn't afford it and they probably didn't need it in today's world. Uh, it wouldn't be bad to have, uh, some body armor, AR 500 armor. They believe that body armor should be accessible to anyone who wants to offer their family protection. They've done it in such a way where you'll actually have money to buy food at the end of the month as well. This is a core philosophical um, component for them. This is something they really focus. In nine years they have been in business, AR-500 Armor has never once raised the price on their flagship $65 rifle rated plate. Don't wait until it's too late. You want to make sure your family is protected. I'd like you to just stop by and see what they have to offer at AR-500 Armor dot com slash back when you visit ar 500 armor.com slash back you're going to find special ready to go bundles that they've built just for you up to 50 percent off if you're new to body armor ar 500 armor has you covered they have a dedicated page with a ready to go layout um, based on whatever scenario you might need better yet they're running their nine year anniversary sale right now sales up to 50 percent off so you and your family are protected Use the promo code BECK and get 20% off everything else in their store to ensure you're well protected. AR500armor.com slash BECK. I don't think you're a Democrat, but you, you were a Democrat. When the Democrats saw what happened with Ronald Reagan, he was a complete outsider. He comes in, he wins in 1980. The Democrats, the first thing they do is put in the uh, what do they call it? The super majority or the uh, super delegate where, where wait. So the people can say one thing, but then this handful of picked by the party politicians can override that. I mean, we've been going in that direction for a long time. There is a very legitimate gripe in the Democratic Party where they, they you can you know the DNC sandbag Bernie both times. <laughs> you know, it, it's like that like like they really are not content to let the people actually choose someone. It's like, well you gotta choose like the person we think is right. How were you ever a Democrat? How was I ever a Democrat? <laughs> I will say, Glenn, I've been an independent now for a couple months and I, I really enjoyed the heck out of uh, my my independence. I just I, I just wanted to believe in big government. I don't believe in big government. The Republicans are big government, but the Democrats are like Stalin sized government, crazy sized government. Uh, so I, I'm a, a big fan of trying to solve problems in the best way possible. It's one reason why I, I'm for something like universal basic income, because I, I think that people are better situated to be able to um, make their own decisions. And, you know, like if you have economic resources in their hands. I do think there is an appropriate place for government on things that, frankly, you know, like no individual or even set of individuals can solve for something like climate change, uh, which I, by the way, think is a very big, real problem. Um, But what what I'd love to see is the government get out of our way for the things that it should be getting out of our way for. (laughs) And and then. And then and then do a better job on the things that it purports to be about, because right right now, the frustration that I think a lot of Americans feel is that 
you, you have the government not doing the things it's supposed to do well, uh, and then sticking its nose into things that it also is it <laughs> like the government's not good at a lot of things, uh, and we we have to try and focus on its core competencies. Uh, is I guess I sound like a business guy when I talk like that, but that's pretty much what I am. Let's go to climate change for a second. I agree climate change is real. I just don't buy any of these answers that we're getting. Um, you know, you, if, you, if you actually care about climate change, if you believe the, the carbon uh, uh, stuff, carbon capture is getting better and better. Nuclear energy is your silver bullet. You don't want any of that. Now the government, through the World Economic Forum, and is starting to control the banks and public-private partnerships. And, and it's we have made so much progress in the United States. And yes, we're not moving at lightning speed, but I think that's because partly it's been so politicized that you've got the same groups going at it with each other. The free market is I, I, the solution. I, I agree um, on nuclear energy. Uh, I agree on carbon capture. I actually championed nuclear energy in the Democratic primary and got beaten up for yeah. it um, because I, I think that that is where the numbers lead you. Yes. Uh, and it, it's a very... <laughs> it's a, it's, it's the safest, know, a, a very, safest form of energy ever created by man. Yeah, it's a very safe, sustainable source of energy. Right. Um, and, and so that that is the problem, is that some of the stuff gets politicized, where you can be like, oh, I'm for sustainability. It's like, okay, good. It's like, I'm for nuclear. It's like, well, no, it's the wrong form. And you're like, right. well, like, why is that? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, and, and then the objections tend to be a bit more um, image-based and ideological than uh, around anything that I saw data for, you know, like when, when you ask people those questions, sometimes you would get arguments that weren't very convincing. Uh, what specific? Like, like, wait, like, no, what, like when I would say, hey, I'm for nuclear, and then people are like, oh, nuclear bad, and I'd be like, why do you think nuclear is bad? And then they would provide oh, yeah. arguments that I was like, well, that that's not really a reason why <laughs> right. nuclear is <laughs> Right, it's not even true at all. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So... Let me go back. We were at UBI and we were talking about people losing their jobs uh, and you were talking about Uber drivers. I just heard the first song, I think, um, that the singer, the lyrics, the music and the singer all AI. And I'm telling you, I couldn't. How was it? It was good. It was good. I mean, I could not believe, and I've been watching, especially the vocal synth uh, synthesization for a while. You you can't, it's not ready for prime time yet, but I'm telling you, it was amazing what I heard. So what jobs are, I get $1,000 a month, but what am I doing? What job will I do? What job will not be taken over by AI? In my ideal version of the world, Glenn, people are able to do things that give them purpose and structure and fulfillment, even if it may not be necessarily um, like driving, you know, GDP or innovation. And so an example I use in my, my book, The War on Normal People, is let's say that you had a town of 10,000 people. Everyone was getting a thousand bucks a month so that you all of a sudden had another ten million dollars in buying power going through that town. And then someone decided that they wanted to start a bakery. Um, well, the bakery now makes a lot more sense because all the people in the town have a little bit extra money to spend. And you know, also know if your bakery fails, then you're not going to die because you're going to be like, oh, I can just like go home and at least survive and figure it out. Um, and so that town would have a bakery, I'm sure, but it would also have um, – you know, like a nonprofit, a religious organization that gets more support, like maybe a mixed martial arts dojo. <laughs> like people would, like, like people would would be doing things. And then if if you say, well, you know, that bakery or that mixed martial arts dojo doesn't matter in the scheme of trying to drive our GDP to the moon, I'd be like, well, who cares? You know, it's like you you have it you have people doing things that they'd find uh, worthwhile and exciting, um, and uh, what one example I'll use in real life too is that I spend some of my time in a college town, 
and college towns look a certain way in part because there's just some you know kids with money walking around who like want want to get a beer on Friday night or, or whatnot, you know, I, I think that if you had UBI, you would actually have more towns resemble college towns because people would just have some more money in their pockets. So don't disagree with that, but let me take you to the opposite side. You then have the, at the very top controlling AI, controlling all of this stuff. You know, you want to talk about the ability to, influence people get them to behave in any way you want you put it up in those into the silicon valley tech leadership and what's right on the horizon what they're already doing in china you've got a very dangerous situation how do you not have those who are getting the thousand dollars and doing their little thing in their little town and that gap gulf between that and those who can really control the strings. Oh, oh, we need to tackle that problem too in a very, very serious way. And one of the arguments I make in my book that's related to what you're describing with Facebook's ability to control our democracy and um, subvert free will uh, uh, on some level uh, is that they sell our data for $200 billion a year, every year, and we're becoming like rats in a maze. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, it should stop. Um, if we decide to have someone access our data for our own convenience, it should still be ours. Uh, I can loan it to you. <laughs> and if you're going to, or sell it to you, if you're going to make money off it too, I should get a cut. I should actually get more than a cut. I should get most of it. Um, so this is a movement around data rights and data privacy and data autonomy that needs to get made yesterday, where these social media companies right now um, are almost like governments unto themselves. Uh, and they've been taking advantage of this massive, massive, uh, frankly, like just failure on the part of our leaders to understand what the heck was going on. Uh, and just, they, they looked up and said, hey, you know, and, and there was a period too. I mean, I, people probably sense like, I like technology, I like progress, but man, have we completely let them um, eat democracy's lunch, shall we say. They, we just like, like eating up everything. Uh, and it's, it's high time that the pendulum swings the other way and you look up and say, look, wait, what's going on? You have like a trillion dollar franchise because of some rules that were written before your company even existed? Like, th does this make any sense? <laughs> so let me, two, two, two parts of this question. One, horse is already out of the barn on that one. Getting that back, the, the rights to my own, my own intellectual data, data is, uh, it seems obvious to me, but the horse is already out of the barn. How are you going to do that? Second part of that is, um, uh, when you're looking at, hang on now, I forgot the second part. Answer the first part and I'll remember the second part of the question. Sure thing, I'd love to tackle the first part. All right, check it out. So once again, the hope comes at the state level where if you want Congress to pass data rights legislation, well, first I will suggest that uh, there are good examples going on in the EU where the EU has been passing various rules saying, look, tech companies access your data, they have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, there, there is now this thought that people are going to get paid for the use of their own data, which uh, I had suggested would be very, very positive. Um, so it is possible, the EU is showing that. Here in the U.S., Congress is, as you'd imagine, out to lunch. Uh, and so one state has passed data rights legislation and created a consumer data protection agency uh, and enabled individuals to have um, organizations bargain for their data rights uh, collectively. So you could have data unions, you could have, uh, you know, uh, like a representative come and say, okay, like if, you, if you're gonna do this, then you have to pay our members this, uh, this and that. Uh, that state is California. They passed a uh, data rights law last year and now they're putting the agency together. And so the argument that I would make to people listening to this is like, why do Californians have more data protection rights than you do? Um, you know, like at the state level, they should just take 
if, if they want to just be lazy, which I have nothing against laziness, I'm an entrepreneur and like entrepreneurs often just frankly take ideas from someplace else. <laughs> so so um, like if you just take the California rule, Montana, and just be like, hey, why don't we just adopt this too? Um, then, you know, you too can have uh, more protection for your consumers. Everyone in your state will be happy. Like, is anyone in your state going to be unhappy that all of a sudden that they have more uh, rights and protections to how their data gets used? So hopefully we can make it so that that California rule is the um, like the start of a wave. I was part of passing that California um, referendum. It, it was a ballot initiative, essentially. Um, and then if enough states do it, then maybe Congress will get its act together. How do you turn that congressional wave when you have Congress and the administration and everybody else not even giving you a right to what you inject into your own bloodstream. I mean, we're losing we're losing the right not only of our of our mind and what we do, you know, in cyberspace, we're losing the right to actually say, no, you're not putting that into my body. Well, again, I don't think Congress is going to be the answer uh, for a lot of these things. I, I feel like the progress can be made at the state level. Um, where the incentives are different. If enough, Amer if enough Americans get together and say, look, like I, I want uh, data protection, I want this sort of uh, ability to make certain kinds of choices, I want to be able to choose a candidate from any party uh, to support or just have an I next to their name as an independent, um, that's really the saving grace. That, and one of the frustrations I think a lot of people share is that our politics have really become nationalized in a particular way. Uh, and I, I, as you can probably tell, like I, I'm, I'm just trying to get stuff done. I'm very practical. <laughs> and, and so if you sense that it's not going to happen in D.C., then you have to try and make it happen at the state level. What California does is California's business. You don't like it move. I know that's horrible, but I shouldn't. Texas should not be able to influence California couple of problems with that on the state level, on the uh, federal level is the, the change that the progressives made with the Senate. But um, on the uh, on the other level is at some point I've always wanted to live in California, but it's run by crazy people. And I know that that state is going to fail at some point if they stay on this same course. It's unsustainable. I chose not to live there, but when it fails, I'm going to be taxed to pay for it. And as far as I'm concerned, Californians, you voted for it. You wanted it. We should not have everybody else bail you out because of those bad decisions. Nobody learns anything. Do you agree with that? Because you can't you can't have the Tenth Amendment right for the states if there's no penalty, if it doesn't work? Well, I, I think that it's fair to, to say, look, uh, another state can make a decision and it shouldn't necessarily, um, you know, like have any repercussions like uh, across the country. I think that's very reasonable. I, I do think that California right now is a net payer, like that they have a massive economy um, I would recommend living there at some point, Glenn. It's like a very pleasant place to live. I mean, you know, you can have, <laughs> you can have. A, I mean, I understand the the, uh, the the concerns you might have, and I've actually spoken on my podcast about some of them. Yeah, my concern is paramount as a business owner. Taxes. It's impossible. I I, I lived in New York City for a while. It took me a year or a year and a half to build uh, two studios up there. I took the Paramount lot in Texas and changed it to a digital space in a week in Texas. I didn't have to jump through all these kinds of hoops that they had me in jumping through in New York. I mean, it's impossible to do business in some of these states. Yeah, no, the, the red tape uh, is out of control in uh, certain parts of the country. Uh, the, the concern that I articulated in my podcast not that long ago was around um, some of like the rising theft and crime rates uh, in parts of uh, the Bay Area where, you know, you, like I walked into a Walgreens and it got robbed in front of me. 
Um, and then a week later, uh, Walgreens announced they were closing <laughs> a number of Walgreens in the Bay Area. You know, like so, some of these things are, um, are are having very very negative impacts. And then you know, and people but are voting isn't with their that, feet. Um, that's not a crime problem. That's a policy problem. That's a that's a problem with the politics, the policies that these people have have put in. It's not. It's you don't have more criminals there than any other place. Um, you, you're just not enforcing the law. I, you're saying you can steal up to this amount and we won't call the police. Well, yeah, I, as you can tell, I disagree with that approach, and I I, I agree with you that there is like a, a leadership issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, talk to me about the, the the thing that really concerns me is. Um, the Fed, if you read any of their you know, their papers, the Treasury and the Fed, they're very much into a Fed coin, which completely defeats the idea and the 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 real love for um, something like Bitcoin. They would control it. They would print it. It would be full faith and credit of the United States, which means nothing. Um, and I. I have a hard time. I own Bitcoin. I believe in Bitcoin. I want Bitcoin or others to to be able to work. But that's an awful lot of power for the government to let go. Do you see cryptocurrency actually surviving China, the United States and Europe coming up with their own coin to be able to control cash and control people? I certainly hope so. I'm a big proponent of uh, cryptocurrencies generally, Bitcoin in particular. Uh, And you're right that the incentive among certain government actors is going to be to try and kill it. Uh, You know, there's been a clear tendency among certain Treasury officials to try and uh, go in that direction. And I, I, I tweeted not that long ago that, look, if you have a trillion dollar industry that could define the future and create thousands of jobs uh try not to screw it up <laughs> you know like, like, like that that to me is fairly common sense uh, i want the forward party to be an interface for the cryptocurrency community in dc because to your earlier point a lot of folks in dc have no understanding or grasp at all on blockchain or or the potential of this technology to help uh, democracy function, uh, help make it so that you don't have so much red tape. Uh, you know, you can actually trust. Imagine a world where you could vote for anyone you wanted uh, from your smartphone and know that it was hacker proof and the rest of it. I mean, like these things are things that are conceivably possible if, if we invest in these technologies um, instead of seeing them as some kind of uh, threat. So, the forward party hopefully will end up trying to bring some kind of sensible integration of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies into the financial system. I'm not someone who thinks that, you know, it's realistic to expect there to be no regulation or no taxation. Um, but you have to try and make it so that they're sensible and don't kill innovation and jobs uh, and an immense amount of value creation so, that could be uh, on the table. Innovation. We talked about global warming a little bit. Uh, I am, I mean, I have a house completely off the grid um, and it's all clean energy. I can afford it. (laughs) Clean energy at this point is unstable and very expensive to make it stable. Um, The idea that we are going to get rid of cars and be a green economy and shut down our coal plants and our nuclear plants by 2030 is insane. Shouldn't we be looking for the things that actually work and then help foster those things without getting into the free market? Just get those prices to get them the work, get the prices to go down, which is all through innovation and get the government out of it. I don't see how we're going to have electric cars if we don't have coal plants in 2030. Uh, 
I agree with you. We should be trying to build on what works. Uh, I did have the pleasure of sitting down with Elon Musk uh, to talk about what the heck we should be doing in this space. And he's in a, a, a huge believer in solar, which makes sense. And then he explained uh, the potential of solar energy to me. Um, and he kind of painted a picture more effectively. Um, but I, I'm with you that you should be making decisions based upon an effective transition and not for political purposes. Uh, you, you can tell that there are some people who look at it and just say, certain form of energy bad, certain form of energy good, let's get rid of the bad, especially when in many cases, there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who are doing jobs in a particular area. And anyone who thinks that we're going to magically be able to transition tens of thousands of people to some other role, like hasn't actually spent any time in a freaking, <laughs> you know, like, like um, you know, coal town, manufacturing town, et cetera. It's like, Just uh, it's like thinking, like, uh, spend time thinking. It's almost that bad. You don't have to be in a coal town to get it. You just have to think. 20 years ago, I said, we are going to approach a time that is going to be as dramatic, if not more so, and I believe now more so, than the entire industrial revolution. But it's all going to happen in about a 10-year period. And I think we're at the beginning yep. of that period. And people have yes. no idea what's coming. You can't make these kinds of changes to everything all at once and expect that everything's going to be fine. I completely agree with you, Len. And, I, I'm, and when you said before where you, where, where you agreed with me on the diagnosis of the problem and then you weren't, you know, you were negative on UBI as a solution and you're still trying to work out what the solution is. I've had versions of that conversation with hundreds, even thousands of people over the last number of years where they're like, OK, I get it. I get that. AI is going to start replacing not just call center workers or Uber drivers, but eventually bookkeepers, uh, insurance agents, yeah, actuaries, like you know, like doctors. It'll keep on just eating through things. Uh, and what the heck are we going to do? Uh, and uh, I'm saying we should begin the wholesale transition for society and also by the way be realistic about how lousy our government is <laughs> trying to address these problems at scale uh, and let people solve their own problems and say look we're going to take some of the uh, incredible gains from ai and the rest of it and just distribute it to everyone in the form of like a thousand dollar dividend a month now there are people like you who look at it and say okay like i, I don't like that particular solution go ahead, go ahead i do like that solution because it's my data that they've been mining. That's what Google was for. Yes, they, that is exactly right. So yes. they've been mining. They built AI on all of us searching on Google and other and yep. doing other things. Absolutely. That's my data. You didn't pay me for it. We should all own that. I have no problem with that. Yeah. Oh, the, the data dividend. That, that, that was my argument where I said, look, what is the oil of the 21st century? It's our data. And just like they have an oil dividend in Alaska, we should have a data dividend for everyone. I even started something called the Data Dividend Project that's trying to um, make that happen in the near term. Um, but we should be doing that. And that, to me, would be one way we can manage what's going to be a hellacious transition period. I mean, this is one of the things I was uh, arguing about in my last book is like, look, if you did everything right, this is going to be a very, very difficult time. But we are doing very little right, which is going to take a very difficult time and make it uh, potentially catastrophic. So when you see what is, you know, I, I you know who Ray Kurzweil is. Do you know him? Yeah. OK, I, I don't think know Ray. Oh, you don't. I think he is. Uh, I mean, I don't know him personally. I yeah, just yeah, know, yeah. You know, I, I know his. Uh, him, yeah. So I, I said to him at one point, you are the most fascinating and exhilarating mind I have been with at the same time, the spookiest damn mind I've been with because his, his logic is we just won't do that. When you bring up anything that could be a bad thing, well, we just won't do that. That's like Google say, don't be evil. Yeah, well... You kind of are. Um, um, and you, you look at what is 
on the horizon. Um, do you believe in the singularity that we will actually hit the singularity or not? Uh, I believe that there will be some artificial generalized intelligence coming down the pike um, that can do things better than we can uh, a in a so certain you believe time in frame. AGI, but not ASI? Uh, that that would be a fair characterization of where I am, yes. Um, where, um, at least in the time frame I'm imagining. And I know as soon as you get an AI that can improve itself, then that improvement can take place in an eye blank. Correct, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And then you, then you wind up in very singularity pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, I'm less concerned about that that version of like the super intelligence uh, than I am of uh, the steps on the path there where yeah. I think that you can have something fall short of real uh, general intelligence um, that is still powerful enough to upend the labor market and the way of life for millions of people. But, uh, but, so that that that's where a lot of my attention is. So then let, let's stay there, because my point on, you know, with Ray is, oh, we just won't do that. Well, China is doing it. China doesn't even have, you know, has AI, not AGI. And look at what China is doing. And we are building the same kind of framework here. And it's really disturbing. Just leaving it at AI, not AGI. And it is yep. it is a powerful force that can enslave people. Yep. Uh, so I agree with you. And I also agree with your critique of Ray's general optimism that there is uh, there's a strain of techno utopianism that assumes uh, the absence of ill intent that uh, yeah. I, I find unrealistic. I do too. <laughs> to be, I mean, to I, be honest. I've read a history yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> Expecting men to be saints is a really bad idea. So you and I are aligned, Glenn, it turns out, uh, on this set of issues where I look at it and be like, guys, uh, this is going to be a fiasco. You know, like uh, if we do get to that level of, of AI, it's going to probably be used for um, something we're not excited about <laughs> like, like very, very quickly. Uh, and the steps on the way there are, are each also going to be I'll, I'll tell you one thing too, Glenn, like I ran for president um, and my concern level has gone up <laughs> in the last two and a half years in part because of my interactions with the, with the news media where it, it turns out, so I would talk regularly about the fact that like, look, We've lost four manufacturing, four million manufacturing jobs over the last number of years in, by the way, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Iowa, the, the swing states that um, uh, the Democrats need to win and used to win. Missouri, like, you know, used to be a swing state. Um, uh, and a, a lot of those four million manufacturing jobs were lost due to automation. Um, and I would have conversations with various media outlets about this. And it was like I was speaking another language, like it didn't matter at all. And there was part of me that w would think to myself is like, hey, would it matter if I said 8 million, 10 million? Like, like I could just like throw a number out there. Like it, like it, it seems immaterial, it is, immaterial to you. It is the <laughs> scariest thing. It's the scariest thing. I used to give the media the benefit of the doubt, about, doubt. And then I actually got into the inside, both of CNN and Fox. It's scary as hell. Scary as hell. The lack of intellectual curiosity on some of the biggest people in media is staggering. You could talk to them and it just it's like you're not even there anymore, are you? You're not even listening to me, are you? You're just waiting to ask the next question that maybe, maybe you wrote down, but probably your producer wrote down. It's become an assembly line, um, and it's become an assembly line to hell. <laughs> I should, you know, be like, it's really that dark. Um, and I had the experience over and over again where I'd be like, hey, guess what? Like, we did a number on these communities, and we're almost certainly going to do the same thing to a lot of other communities. Like, what do you think? <laughs> and people would, you know, pe people would... Um, have the expression you described where it's like, this is interesting. Let me get to the next question. Um, and I, 
connected with enough Americans where they started to hear what I was saying and say, wait a minute, like I think the Asian guy is onto something. <laughs> and oh, by the way, he doesn't seem and, and oh, by the way, he doesn't seem like a politician. And like he seems to be saying these things because he believes them. And I don't get the sense from him that he's, you know, like a, a malign narcissist. Uh, and so, you know, that I mean, that's pretty much my campaign in a nutshell is like I was trying to uh, be what Joe Rogan called me, like the Paul Revere of automation. Mm hmm. You are. You are. Uh, so I'm trying to imagine how those debates were so fra I know I've been talking about I've been beating a, a dead horse for a while on a few things that are, are really quite frightening that nobody will pay attention to. And uh, and I know I stand in a room full of people and they're talking about garbage. I have a really hard time. Uh, ben Franklin said, I think in 1774, I can't go to parties anymore. I can't talk to people anymore. The times are too important. And I go to places and they're just talking about, you know, frivolous stuff and it drives me out of my mind. What was it like to be in the belly of that beast being the Paul Revere and having all these people act like you were the crazy one? Uh, the day to day, Glenn, uh, was exciting because I found my message was connecting with the American people and I would do events um, when I wasn't in front of a TV camera, I would do a rally in Iowa or I'd do a rally um, in New Hampshire and hundreds of people would show up and I'd think like, oh, like this is connecting, you know, we can do this, we can do this. So to take the Paul Revere metaphor further, like I was on my horse and then you'd go in and, and sure, I'd have media interviews where I was like, well, you know, like I, I hope that reached somebody. Um, but then I would talk to real life flesh and blood Americans uh, in their hometowns. Um, and I felt like it was working. And so when I would uh, ride around, I mean, it wasn't a horse, it was like a rental vehicle, but you know, I'd like be dry or in Iowa, it was a bus. It had horsepower. Um, but I felt uh, like I was almost channeling something else for those weeks and months, uh, invigorated, um, and I, I tell people that it was only after um, we failed to make a certain threshold in Iowa, New Hampshire, that I feel like, um, you know, I went from being on horseback to walking on the ground myself again. <laughs> and and I, was, I was joking that I felt like I was um, like William Wallace and Braveheart or something where I was like riding around on horseback and, um, and in slow motion uh, for a while there. And then uh, it was only after we didn't hit our goals that uh, I was like on the ground looking for my helmet. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, uh, uh, let me, let me talk to you a little bit about um, on your campaign, riding the horse, feeling like you are making an impact. You had the help of Dave Chappelle. And you had some, the people who cut through, you know, Joe Rogan, Chappelle. Chappelle actually campaigned with you. And those people, they are attracting your kind of person. What happened? Why, yes. why, why no impact or very little impact? A lot of it, Glenn, is that uh, I was going in, going through a Democratic primary, um, where if you look at the Joe Rogan audience, uh, it's enormous. You look at the Dave Chappelle audience, it's enormous. How many of those people were Democratic caucus goers in Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, or to to a lesser extent, uh, it's more inclusive. The second group, but Democratic primary voters in New Hampshire. Um, there was one poll I saw that was interesting. It had me at something like. 14% of support in the general population. Um, I also was the candidate that people wanted to have a beer with the most. I won the Iowa youth vote. 
Mm. Um, I had various strains of support that unfortunately did not overlap that heavily with the Democratic <laughs> primary electorate. Right. Um, which, which is one reason why I'm now so passionate. And this is not self-serving. It's just because, you know, I've been through this process now um, that we need to open it up. We need to make it so that everyone can vote. Uh, in these primaries, because if you just subject it to folks who are traditional Democratic voters, you're going to have a different uh, outcome. But would you agree? Uh, and I'm the math guy. Hmm? But would you agree? I just that... want to point out that oh, go ahead. that 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 in in Iowa, like the percentage of people that actually voted in the caucus was something like six percent. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, like when I would walk around Iowa State there would be a lot of kids who'd be excited about me, maybe because they saw the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, I have a hunch that a lot of them didn't show up on caucus night because they, <laughs> they might not have been, uh, you know, traditional Democrats. Right. So, but do you think with forward being a third party, would you have restrictions on anyone? So anyone could cross party lines and vote in your primary, or would you have to be somebody that says, I I want to vote in this primary, not, you know, not, not in the Democrat and the Republican and forward. Oh, thanks for the question, Glenn. Um, the process that we're fighting for is a completely open primary where you can show up and you can vote for whomever you want under the sun. Um, and All so it's not that there day. is a uh, same, same day. Yeah, just okay. like everyone just shows up and yeah. Um, and, and uh, and then in our ideal world, then like the top five candidates from any party go through to an instant runoff. And this is the system they've implemented in Alaska, though I think they had top four instead of five. Um, but I, we just don't believe in closed party primaries. Like mm-hmm. the last thing I want is for the forward party to have another closed party primary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I, I want people to come in and just be able to vote for whoever they think okay. is best. Um, and try and vote for the the candidate and not the letter next to their name. So really, um, you so, know, but, it, it's, but, it's messing. Yeah, go ahead. But really hard to do, Andrew. And you know this. I'm assuming it's one of the reasons why during the primary you didn't come on here is you wouldn't want to be associated with my point of view or have my praise because you knew the left, the uber uber left or the media would take it and just drag you through the mud. The interesting thing about I started this podcast to to have people that can agree on a set of principles, the Bill of Rights. But now we might not agree on anything else, but we can leave with respect for one each one another and understand what the other person is actually thinking. That's not happening in America. You if you are a Republican, you are for big business um, you know, no taxes for the rich. You don't care about the poor and let's just have another war. Well, I don't agree with any of those things, any of them. And people put me in the category of Republican and that's not how I would describe a Republican either. So how do you do an open primary when it's, you know, nuclear energy, bad, solar, good, good. Well, that, that is the, the key to this. Uh, and in these states, and I'm actually going to have fun right now. I just have the list of states. I'm not going to do it entirely, but it's like Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Florida, Idaho, that uh, these are all states where if enough people got together and said, hey, let's change it to an open primary, then you can make it happen. Uh, now, is that easy? No, it's hard. But I just want people listening to this to imagine a process where then you can run from any party you uh, and you can vote for whomever you want. Do you think more people would care about politics? The fact is right now, 83 percent of these races are safely Democratic and safely Republican. So, you know, your vote does not matter if you're a Republican um, in lots of New York state, for example, like, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, like it, 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 And so then when people try and convince you, it's like, oh, like vote, it matters. You're like, well, for some reason, I get the sense that my vote's um, kind of irrelevant. And it is irrelevant in 83% of the country. What you have to do is make it so that people are actually competing and contesting for our support. And it's not just, okay, I got appointed by the insiders of my party and I, I'm gonna have the money. And so now everyone knows it's going to be me and there's like no suspense in the general. And like it's 
it's not a real democracy, Glenn. Like right now, we we have like a, a simulated democracy. When you start getting into the nuts and bolts of it, now that you've said it this way, I have to because uh, I've wanted to say something about three times. We're not a democracy; we're a republic, uh, and there that is yeah. a huge important difference uh, that I always made fun of people who used to say that until recently. Because now I'm like, no, there is a really there is a big difference. But you're right; we are not the people are not selecting their representative. It's not. They're pre-selected nope. in many in many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and, and that's one, that was one of the interesting ingredients about my run is that people knew I was not selected. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But you've left one part out of this equation, um, even though we've talked about it. The other part of the equation is not just opening it up so everyone can run and you could vote for anyone. This republic uh, can't be kept by an ignorant, especially a self-imposed ignorant group of people. Um, we, our media is corrupt, our schools are corrupt, and our intellectual uh, curiosity on the average person also seems to be going down. They don't know even how to critically think. So it doesn't that have to be part of the solution? How do people get their message out in this transition? Uh, I agree with your characterization of the problems. Uh, I think we need to elevate independent voices uh, that aren't of the corporate media. And it's something that I would, I would love to help with. Uh, when you talk about folks like Joe Rogan and Dave Chappelle who helped me get my message out, one of my beliefs now, Glenn, is that people don't trust institutions anymore, but they do trust certain people. Like a lot of people trust you. A lot of people trust Dave. A lot of people trust Joe. You know, a lot of people trust Barry Weiss. I mean, whomever it is. So uh, if we were to elevate that type of voice, uh, I think that we would have a chance to rebuild some degree of trust and uh, cohesion, coherence, really. Coherence would be the, the right word. They're already, I mean, you know, my platform, we beat CNN almost every night. You know, if there were actual ratings, I can see what's behind the paywall. I can see their ratings. We beat them almost every night. It's the trust is already being built with those people. It's the legitimizing because the mainstream media has spent so much time delegitimizing somebody like Barry Weiss. So that, that's what I'd love to help reverse. Um, and I agree with you that by the numbers, you're right. Like a lot of the people I just named have. I mean, Joe Rogan uh, is smashing, then, you know, audiences on network TV all the time. Uh, and, and this is part of the distortion too, Lynn, where you have – uh, a mainstream media narrative, and then it plays into um, the duopoly. And then you have this undercurrent of all these people that are questioning it and trying to figure out, okay, like, how do we change things? And the forward party is the way that we can make our politics actually mirror what the people uh, are seeing and what they want. And right now, there is this disconnect that threatens to destroy us, truly, where it's like, hey, there are a lot of you and you, you recognize that this is not true <laughs> and you recognize that the fix is in, but you don't have a choice. Like, we're, we're going to try and make it so that you, you feel like, you know, you, you're going to have to vote for um, either A or B. And I'm suggesting it's like, you know, what? I think the American people at this point, uh, one of the arguments I make too, Glenn, uh, Ross Perot got 19.3 percent of the vote in 1992 in a more trusting time, I'm going to suggest. Uh, I, uh, an independent I know who is considering running for president in 2020, he obviously didn't go through with it, um, but he pulled himself at 25% um, this past cycle. I think that if you had a credible independent running in 24, they start out at 20 to 25%. Um, if the, you know, if the Democratic and Republican field looks like, um, looks like it did in 2020. Um, so there's this this continuing upswing in people that are questioning the mainstream media narratives. Uh, you can see it in your audiences, you can see it in you know Joe's and Barry's and everyone else's. 
And the question is, how does that start reflecting itself in our politics? Well, I, I will tell you that it is um, a terrifying time to be alive and a exhilarating time to be alive. And the only reason why it's terrifying is because I have no idea how it ends. Um, are we... Uh, are we in that 10 year period that I talked about with the industrial revolution, this 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 revolution of all things? Do you think we're in that period yet? Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely are. And the pandemic sped it up. Um, one, one of the things that you saw very clearly is that a, n- a number of companies invested a lot more in automation over the last 24 months. When when do the average when does the average American really begin to feel it and go? Oh, I know that. I know what's going. I see it now. The the next several years, in my opinion, um, we actually are already feeling it in different ways. If you look at the labor force participation rate, it has been low and uh, sputtering and declining for a number of years now. Uh, it's in the low 60s, uh, maybe even high 50s. I, I'd have to double check. Um, but when I looked into it, a couple of years ago, our peer countries were El Salvador and the Ukraine in terms of the labor force participation rate. Uh, and that's getting worse, not better. We were down something like uh, 4 million jobs the last I checked. Um, and uh, someone told me it was like the equivalent of the labor force of Pennsylvania disappearing um, from the workforce. So it's here with us now, Glenn. Uh, it's Um, spreading in different ways. The thing I I have to try and remind people is that it's not like you're going to go to work one day and then there's going to be a robot sitting in your chair. That's what happened. Or even that you go to the mall and there's like a robot kiosk. Though there is probably a robot kiosk in your mall (laughs) at this point. Um, It's more likely that the mall just closed um, and the robot was in the Amazon Fulfillment Center, you know, (laughs) like across the state. Correct. Correct. Um, you are fascinating. I, I wish you the uh, the best. I hope you come on again. You uh, have a I think you have an important voice and important role in our future. And I wish more people would listen to you. Grateful. And I want to take you up on this offer to campaign at the state level. I mean, like, let, let's freaking free our electorate. Um, so I would love to team up with you. I'm looking at these states right now, looking at places where Maybe you and I could team up, but yeah. uh, but thank you. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I apologize that it's taken me so long to get here. Um, for what it's worth, uh, you know, the, I like I actually had no. Uh, oh, I know that. That those decisions were. Oh no, I know just that. Running around uh, on a bus. There's no. <laughs> there is no hard feelings, and every time I would ask, I'd say to our booker, "Can you just ask Andrew if he'd come on again?" And she'd look at me and she'd say, they're going to say no again. And I said, they should say no. But just in case one of them has a mental lapse, because I just don't think it would have been to your advantage uh, to be on during the primary. So even your people, I give a pass to. Well, thank you. And yet another wonderful thing about not being a Democrat anymore, Glenn, I can talk to whoever the heck I want. And I got to say, uh, this is not the last time you Good. and I sit down thank for you sure. So much. Appreciate it.